Hello again, everybody. It's Scott Casper, Takedown Media, Nike Hot Seat, very special guest, a man who successfully went from amateur wrestling to professional wrestling. As a matter of fact, there's a new book out about him. It's called Backland, From All-American Boy to Professional Wrestling's World Champion. He joins us now in the Nike Hot Seat, Bob Backland. Ba Bob, how are you? I'm having a great day, Scott. I, I got to tell you, first of all, congratulations on the book, writing out a a uh, four or five hundred page book is is uh, not easy when looking back at one's life, but you were successful in doing so. The book has been selling well and getting uh, rave reviews. Yeah, it's been. I'm very proud of the book. I'm proud of what it says, and uh, it's uh, great. Uh, it's a great avenue for me to. Uh, um, I've always tried to get young people encouraged to be in, uh, you know, amateur wrestling, uh, and. Um, um, it kind of explains why, because I learned a lot of principles from uh, wrestling that really helped me become successful in life. It was at about 14, if I recall, you had some trouble in your life and wrestling really uh, turned your life around. Can you talk about that time in your life? Well, it, it's kind of a long story, but uh, I, I didn't want to go home. I went out to, for athletics, football, wrestling and track, so I didn't have to go home. I, I uh, stayed away from home as much as I could. I have a father that wasn't a very good drinker. Uh, so, but I was, uh, I had a lot of people that were friends that uh, I was doing a lot of bad things with them. And I was standing on the top of a fence, pretty close to falling on my face and being a disaster as far as the life. And uh, uh, I slowly got pulled out of that situation through, through athletics and especially through, uh, you know, high school wrestling. It, it. Uh, was uh, it taught me a lot of things. Uh, it taught me about uh, the lesson of, uh, you know, hard work paying off. It taught me about the mind has to be right or you're not going to get any place. And it taught me you don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. And that's, that's something Gables lived by, Danny Hodges lived by, uh, everybody that's been successful. As a matter of fact, your life has been one very, very clean life. No drugs, steroids. Uh, people always looked at you in your younger days, uh, and even even today, and there is uh, no hint of steroids at all, no hint of drug use at all, whether that's marijuana, alcohol, etc. Everything has been absent. All the uh, the bad things in life have been absent from yours, allowing you to to um, be elevated in such a way as really truly being the all American boy from Princeton, Minnesota. I learned so. I had a lesson in peer pressure when I was in eighth grade. Uh, I had some friends that I would have did anything for them, and they were going to get in a fight with a motorcycle gang. We were at a place called the Kitten Club, and I told them I'd help them. I went out the door. The motorcycle gang was outside. I turned around and looked back, and the door slammed shut, and nobody else came out. I was standing there. I was in eighth grade, and there was a bunch of motorcycle guys. I was scared to death, and I think they thought it was crazy because I came out there by myself. They left town. I walked home that night. I was seven miles away from uh, my house thinking, how in the heck do you know when you find a friend at eighth grade? And I learned something there about peer pressure, and I never came to peer pressure again in my life. When I got into the wrestling business, all the people, at, the older people in the business tried to get me to do drugs with them, but I wouldn't do it. I said no because of what happened to me in eighth grade. Well, coming up July 21st and, uh, through the 23rd, that special weekend, you'll be inducted into the George Tragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame wing of the Dan Gable Museum in Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, first of all, how were you notified of this, and who made that call? Well, I was, I was asked a long time ago to be in that Hall of Fame, and I refused. I said, I don't deserve to be in the same Hall of Fame as Danny Hodge and Dan Gable. I don't think I should be able to go in, and I didn't do it. But uh, uh, um, Mike Chapman is a what got to be a pretty good friend. I was talking to him at that time, and then uh, I've talked to Jerry Briscoe a, w a little while back, and I've decided to go into the Hall of Fame. And it's an honor for me to be in the same Hall of Fame as Danny Hodge and Dan Gable. I just uh, um, I'm I'm not at their level as far as amateur wrestling goes, and I just respect them so much. It's just going to be a pleasure to be able to be inducted into Hall of Fame finally. There was nobody in professional wrestling with your pedigree from amateur wrestling. You became known as one of the most scientific mat wrestlers in the sport. 
You debuted with Vern Gagne back in uh, the AWA days in Minnesota. That was in 1973. Bob, do you remember that? When I left, uh, I left Princeton, Minnesota to go wrestle. It, 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 I had my first match down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I was trained by Eddie Sharkey, not Vern Gagne. Um, so I, I had a lot of match. I had started out down Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I, and I, when I left Princeton, Minnesota in 1973, I had a foundation uh, under me, and I, I was on a road to uh, leaving, uh, living a very happy, healthy. Uh, and successful life because of the things I learned from amateur wrestling. I was going to succeed no matter what, and nobody was going to stop me. And that happened to me at Waldorf Junior College, where I left a pretty big mark there. I even left a bigger mark at North Dakota State University because of the things that I learned from amateur wrestling. And then I got into WWF. There was people that had been in the WWF for 10 years figuring uh, they're going to replace Bruno San Martino. Uh, when he decides to retire, I replaced him because I outworked him, because I go, went the extra mile, and because I never gave up. Never gave up, indeed. You sold out Madison Square Garden on countless occasions and other arenas around the country and, and uh, working in Japan and around the world as a traveling champion. Back then, champions really did travel, and, and uh, you worked very, very hard for the promotion and for the sport. Um, and you did it in many ways for the fans. You loved the attention, but you got the right kind of attention. You were considered a face. In, you know, in 1977, Vince McMahon Sr. is out there looking for an all-American boy <laughs> to, to replace Bruno San Martino. And he, he talked to all the promoters all over the country, and the, the, all the promoters only said one name. If somebody was going to be an All-American boy, they only mentioned one name to Vince McMahon Sr. And he picked that guy to be his next. Uh, I was a constant underdog in the wrestling business. But there was always hope and there was always some way that uh, maybe I was going to figure out how to beat somebody. I was, I was usually laying on the mat with my hand up in the air. My opponent would win the war. I would just win the match. <laughs> Which at the end result, that's the, that's the column that actually matters. <laughs> well, you know what? Most of the people that I wrestled did better after I beat them than before. It's called putting them over, I think. Because I, I never hurt their career. Terry Funk and Dory Funk and Harley Race gave me some big lessons in the business of wrestling and gave me some good knowledge where uh, you try, you make your opponent, you make your opponent. And then you win, but you keep him strong. Keep him strong and strong indeed. Well, you kept superstar Billy Graham strong uh, in a sold-out performance at Madison Square Garden, where in 1978 you won the WWF title. How special was that night for you and Arnold Skolan? Well, that was uh, that was the most memorable night of my life because I met superstar Billy Graham in Fargo, North Dakota, at the YMCA. Believe it or not, North Dakota State didn't have a weight room. I used to go to the weight room at the YMCA to train there, and Billy Graham was having a match at the Civic Center in Fargo, North Dakota that was in the AWA. I met him there, and we said hello. He asked me if I was thinking about getting into the wrestling business. I said, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> anyway, about five years later, I'm standing in Madison Square Garden. There's 27,000 people in a garden, and I'm looking – and I'm going to take the WWE title away from Billy Superstar Graham, a guy that I met in Fargo, North Dakota Amazing. at the YMCA as five years before that. As champion of the then WWF, you had the longest reign of any uh, one before you in the modern era of 2,135 days. That meant you had a target on your back. You had to wrestle usually the last match of the, of the uh, card. That meant you had to face the best of the best. Uh, there were hardly any nights off for you when it came to uh, defending your title. Can you talk about the work uh, level you had to endure? Well, you know what? Uh, I, um, I had a system. I, I, uh, I, I did two exercises for most of my career in the WWF, and one was the Harvard step test. I had a box made that I could put in my suitcase and then unravel the box 
and do the Harvard step down. It was 18 inches high. And then I had one of those wheels, a six inch wheel with a rod between it and roll that back and forth. I used to do the Harvard step test for an hour a day. And then, uh, and then I'd get done with that. And then I'd do the wheel right after that. I'd go up and do 400 reps in one set. That was my two workouts. I actually, but it was I, gruesome. I actually got the, uh, that folding step stool you're talking about. Uh, it's, uh, it, it folds, it has a, uh, two hinges on it and then, well, two, three hinges actually, but folds into a nice complete package. You can put it into your luggage, but I got it from somebody up in, uh, in North Dakota. I remember yep. it to this day, it's wooden and it was, says design for Bob Backlund. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my little invention. I was doing a Harvard step test on just a box and I wanted to, I wanted to be able to do it wherever I went. So I would do it. I'd go to a motel. I'd turn up the heat in the room, just like the wrestling room, and I'd do the Harvard step in the, in the room, and then I'd do the wheel after that. You were too. I, I had a special wheel made. I, the ones that I bought in the store, I could wear them out in two months. <laughs> they would. The, they were plastic, and the plastic would get warm because I did so many reps, and there'd be little plastics laying down on the floor where I'd do the wheel. We're talking with Bob Backlund. He's the All-American boy. His former WWF champion. Um, just an incredible, incredible run as a uh, as a talent within the sport. He'll be recognized by being inducted into the George Tragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame in uh, July 21st, 23rd this summer in Waterloo, Iowa. You can join us there for that induction. I know Gable will be there and so many others. It's uh, such an outstanding honor to be able to recognize somebody who's lived the life uh, the way life should be lived. And uh, there was a time when you stepped away from wrestling, uh, Bob. It was... Uh, I got to believe it was 1984. Uh, yeah, 1984. Was, what, yep, what, you're what, right. What caused your departure? Um, Vince McMahon passed away in 1984, and he was it his his it was his uh, um, his thoughts and his uh, that person that uh, put uh, the All American Boy on the map. And uh, uh, when he passed away, things changed. And I wasn't a schmoozer of promoters. I didn't. Uh, I didn't do any of the political things uh, that other people do as far as trying to say certain things to promoters. I stayed away from that completely. Uh, and um, uh, my my foundation was gone when Vince McMahon Senior was gone, and uh, uh, I I, uh, I didn't feel any anybody else was going to respect the All American Boy like he did. Vince McMahon Senior became a father to me. Because his word was so good. A lot of people were trying to talk him out of putting the championship on me, including Billy Superstar Graham. And Vince McMahon said, I promised him and I'm going to give it to him. It doesn't make any difference what you think. Well, you, you went back to the WWF and then uh, reignited your career in 1993 as uh, a, a bit of a different character, Bob. Can you describe Mr. Backlund? Well, we, you know, at that time went back and I was going to be, I came back to be the All-American boy again, but it found, I found out that people didn't care about the All-American boy anymore. And uh, I went to Vince McMahon and I asked him uh, if I could be bad. He said, well, he said, why do you want to be bad now when you refuse to be bad in the 80s? I said, for one thing, my daughter's older now and the people that were, I was a hero to will understand. I want to be bad because the good guys are lying, cheating, and swearing. Let me be bad by being good. <laughs> and I was being bad by saying, I'm going to make you responsible for your own actions. I don't want you throwing garbage out of the car window. You're disgracing our country. You're going to have to recite the presidents of the United States to me to get my signature. And I thought all those things were good. And I was really driven. People would ask me if I went crazy at that time. I was just really into what I was doing. <laughs> and I was very serious about it. And it was all non-scripted. I didn't have a writer. I said exactly what was in my heart. And I probably meant every word of it. I love it. You and I became the most hated guy ever in the business at the time. I could do a five-minute promo and never say a word. 
you know, it's guys like you, Sergeant Slaughter, that absolutely uh, reveled in the character being a heel, if you will, a bad guy. And uh, the fans bought into it. The fans uh, loved it. They booed you. Uh, and you know what? When you defeated Bret Hart in the 94 Survivor Series to lay claim to your second world title, um, it was actually kind of a momentous occasion as everything old was new again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's you know, and uh, in the '80s, I I, 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 there's an interview out there where I said I'm going to get it back sometime. <laughs> that was in the '80s, like it's probably '84, uh, and uh, I, I had to go back and fight and get it back one way or another, whether it was going to be a good gay or a bad guy. Uh, I was going to succeed. I, I've always been driven. I always wanted to get to the top, and uh, um, you know, I'm. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm determined. <laughs> determined indeed. Well, uh, you uh, were determined enough to be a great star in the WWE, then WWF, now WWE, recognized you by installing you into their Hall of Fame in 2013. There's a picture of that on the wall here in my office. Uh, right, yeah. it is a, it's a special recognition when a jury of your peers says, hey, it's, it's time to recognize Bob Backlund. And uh, I got to believe that was a pretty special time for you as well. Yeah, it was. It was. It was uh, very exciting. And, you know, there were some things that were going on behind the scenes where I didn't do it for a lot of years. But the, the WWF uh, took care of everything and everything got straightened out finally. I, I waited 30 years. But uh, and it was a pleasure to finally do that. Bob Backlund, our guest in the Nike hot seat today. His new book is called Backlund, From All-American Boy to Pro Wrestling's World Champion. You can find it at backlundenergy.com. Again, backlundenergy.com. And that's with a U, by the way, backlundenergy.com. Uh, originally out of Princeton, Minnesota, he's made his way around cr across the country and around the world uh, in the name of wrestling, either as an amateur or a pro. And uh, what a job he's done. He'll be inducted into the uh, George Tragos Luthez Hall of Fame this uh, summer, July 21st through the 23rd in Waterloo, Iowa. Joining some uh, great guys in that uh, Hall of Fame. And, and, and this is going to be a wonderful uh, class as well. Uh, it's uh, outstanding. By the way, you can get tickets for the Hall of Fame. 100 bucks a piece. And those are all access passes if you call them at 319 233 Zero seven four five three one nine two three three zero seven four five. Check the nwhof.org website, nwhof.org website for more information there as well. Uh, the 2016 Hall of Fame class includes George Tragos Award winner Chael Sonnen, Luthez Award winner J.J. Dillon. The Jim Melby Award goes to our friend Dave Meltzer, uh, Frank Gotch Award, Lex Luger. The living inductee is Bob Backlund, and the posthumous inductee is Joe Blanchard. There is one more living inductee to be released by uh, the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, Gable Museum, and we'll let you know who that is in the future. Bob, you have some ultimate goals with this book. Um, you and I talked about this. Uh, and by the way, fans, again, you can order his book at backlandenergy.com, the 500-page tome, if you will. Um, you had some goals that you and I talked about. We reminisced a bit yesterday about a guy named Jack LaLanne and how much your careers actually mirrored each other. He was never a professional wrestler, but he was. Yes, a, he was. He was a he? professional wrestler out in, uh, out in California for, for a while. Yeah. I did not know that. He didn't expand his career, but uh, he was he was in it. And uh, I read his Echopedia, and uh, it had it in there where he was uh, he was out there. And wrestling was pretty big out in that time in California. Well, in, this, in the same regard, I, I was wrong there, but uh, perhaps I'll be right when I say that he was so interested in exercise science and how to develop the body and keep yourself healthy. became one of the first TV shows of its kind. Now you see bunches of them, of course. But um, he really had an, uh, an idea of how to keep America strong and healthy, didn't he? Yeah, and my, you know, I'm on a, I'm, you know, I, being, when I left home in Princeton, Minnesota, and going to college and doing that, I was on a little bit of a mission, and, uh, 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 and um, I'm on a mission right now, um, and it's the most important mission that anybody could ever do, because I'm going to try to convince people of all ages to uh, stay fit and to eat right and to treat people how you want to be treated uh, through this book, uh, 
it's uh, there's some avenues in here that can, uh, or a road, I should say, a road to uh, a very happy, healthy, and successful life if you utilize these principles that are in this book. That's what I'm excited about, and I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. Encourage people to be healthy, to be strong, and be determined, and never give up, and be fair, and always have respect for yourself. That's the bottom line, because Bob Backlund said so, and I'm, I've been a fan of Bob Backlund since, well, since I started in television in 1975. His legend, of course, began long before that, but uh, Bob, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm looking forward to seeing you in July. Uh, I can't wait to read the rest of the book. Again, the book is called Backlund, simply that, Backlund, From All-American Boy to Pro Wrestling's World Champ. And people are interviewing you, by the way, Bob. Um, uh, you you had your first podcast interview just the other day. Who was it with? Was oh, it Vince I, Russo? That, that was a uh, Vince Russo. Yeah, we yeah. just got done with one a little while. Yeah, he's gonna. It's supposed to play pretty about, about this week, I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, Vince Russo, but, uh, one, of, one of the great writers and sometimes pro wrestler, but. Uh, uh, tremendous guy behind the scenes for the most part in pro wrestling. Um, I want you to talk a bit about Arlen uh, uh, Skoland. Uh, not everybody had a valet or a manager or uh, a pretty girl to walk him out to the ring. You had one of the best uh, guys in the world of, of sport theater uh, working with you. Can you talk to us about Arnold? Well, Arlen Skoland was uh, Bruno San Martino's uh, you know, manager his whole career, and uh, and Vince McMahon uh, Senior didn't tie me to uh, um, to Bruno San Martino any way. He wanted me to be an outsider, somebody that would be completely different, and we were. Bruno San Martino was even his stuff in the ring was completely opposite of mine. Um, when he uh, when he beat somebody, the people had to leave the territory because he beat him, he beat him, beat him, beat him. I just barely won, and most of like how how good was Sergeant Slaughter's career after I beat him? How good was Don Morocco's career after I beat him? How about Jimmy Snuka? They became more successful than I was, um, and, and so I was that guy that uh, just barely won. Uh, and Arnold Skolan um, uh, got we got close together because he used to go down and work out at the. Uh, uh, New York Athletic Club and wrestle each other and put each other in holes and stuff. So he was very knowledgeable about wrestling and uh, uh, he was uh, just a wonderful manager. And that was a little tie uh, to uh, Bruno San Martino. I respect Bruno San Martino uh, tremendously. He was the greatest wrestling champion ever. He had it for a long, long time, the title. And uh, I, uh, I was just glad to have that little tie with him. When we first met, we didn't know each other. I didn't really care about him, and he didn't care about me. But we found out that we're pretty much on the same page as far as being healthy and being happy and doing uh, the right things. There was another one that was named Classy Freddie Blassie. Um, it seems to me those guys were not cut necessarily from the same cloth, but from the same era. Am I, am I right on that? But they were both very good. Uh, they were assets to the business. And it, in the wrestling business, it, it takes all kinds. Uh, even a guy like George the Animal Steel. You, you, why? But you, he entertained people. and He was a wild man. But uh, uh, there's room for all kinds of people, all kinds of characters. Yeah, Jimmy is a tremendous guy living down in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Hear yep. from him from time to time. Bob, who was the stiffest uh, wrestler you were expected to compete against on uh, a series of uh, events leading up to a, a, a major event? Uh, the stiffest? Yeah. I heard it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Briscoe said that I was like trying to move a, a parking meter. <laughs> and I don't well, know if you... You're, yeah. let be, let's be truthful. You're, you're from your calves up your hamstrings to your glutes... I mean, you were you were just a, a master of, of of muscling your body to the correctness. I mean, you were not just strong; you were big and strong. I understand you could carry four full sheets of drywall up a ladder. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I used to. I I had a, after I got stopped wrestling. I I had a drywall business uh, for a while, but uh, I do pull ups in the L position. 
<laughs> Why does that surprise me? That does. <laughs> Nothing should surprise me at this point. Fans, we're going to uh, uh, say goodbye to Mr. Bob Backlund, uh, somebody I've enjoyed knowing and, and look forward to getting to know even better. Uh, and you can do that with his new book. It's called Backlund, From All-American Boy to Pro Wrestling's World Champion. It's available at Backlund energy.com the 500 page uh, book you might get a personal note from him uh, and it would be I think it would be good to add this to your collection for a lot of reasons there's a lot of uh, life truths in this book that he learned from guys like Bucky Mon and others from amateur wrestling and then what he learned from the others in the sport and in the business of pro wrestling he's been our guest today in the Nike hot seat Bob in closing is there anything you'd like to add we haven't touched on well, you know what? Uh, again, uh, I want to travel all over the world. I want to uh, uh, go and talk about health and determination and success to, to people of all ages. If there's ever anybody out there that wants to uh, contact me through uh, backlandenergy.com and set up a speak engagement, I really love going to libraries and talking about the book. Uh, I, I actually like going any place. I'm so proud of what's going on in this book and what it can do and uh, where it can bring somebody. All you have to do is apply it into your life and uh um i'm i'm just very excited to get out there and uh, do as much as i can with it and uh explain this the story of my life and uh how the story got so good because of uh the things that i picked up through the, the sport of amateur wrestling i uh, i love that sport uh it's a great sport and uh um it prepares you for for life because it's one-on-one -on -one and you've got to look on the mirror you got to say it was my fault. You can't blame it on anybody else, and that's what life is about. You Thank you very it. much, Paul, uh, Scott. It's been great. Appreciate it, and see you. Uh, see you in July. Absolutely, Bob Backlund, Nike Hot Seat special guest today again. The book Backlund from All American Boy to Wrestling's World Champ. BacklundEnergy.com. For all of us at Takedown Media, I'm Scott Casper. Thanks for watching.